Well, we do have a housekeeping uh, announcement now. It's uh, essentially the session will go until 10.45 or so. Uh, Chris Horner has a book signing uh, directly after this session in the exhibit hall. The title of his book is called Power Grab and how <coughs> Obama's green policy will steal your freedom and bankrupt America. Next up will be Professor uh, Leighton Stewart. will be talking about CO2 being food for plants. Excellent. Believe it or not. Thank you, Willie. I'm going to talk about two subjects. I'm going to talk about the benefits of more carbon dioxide, and I'm also going to talk about the empirical test of whether CO2 is really causing global warming. Great news. Earth's atmosphere needs more CO2. That does get attention. This is my attempt to communicate with the public. The following is based on 2,254 peer-reviewed studies, experiments, etc. It is documented in this little book right here. Craig Edso is sitting in the back. He and Dr. Singer down here put this together. 2,254 studies that what I'm about to say is based upon. Highlights from that, additional CO2 produces astonishing plant growth. There's no question about that. I'll show you a slide. It causes plants to need less water. This is another coming environmental problem. In some cases, a lot less water. We can see plants moving into the desert. Current CO2 levels remain near their 500 million year lows, despite what everybody makes you think. Most plants were developed or evolved in a more CO2-rich atmosphere. So CO2 is the staff of life for the plant kingdom, and without it, there'd be no life on Earth, and it clearly is not a pollutant, which I'll expand upon a little bit. And Earth's climate history does not indicate that CO2 is a major driver of climate change. What does it do for the plants? Some of you in the back can't read this. Look at the grains. Let's add about 70% more CO2, and we may get there early in the next century. 300 parts per million. Barley, rice, wheat, soybeans down here, the real huge food supply for the earth. 41% increase. CO2 alone, changing nothing else. 34% for rice, 33 wheat. 47% for soybeans, then you go to some of the regular things like white potatoes, 29%, sweet potatoes, 37 tomatoes, 31 Look what it does for the trees. It, the average on all of the trees is that if we put 300 parts per million more in there, the trees, our forest would grow by 50% more, all based on real studies. Look what I, what I just showed you was this lower level of adding 300 parts per million here. If you add 600 parts per million or even 900, and I think we'll run out of fossil fuels before we get there, but look what these are, 50% for fruits and melons, vegetables here that I talked about, 75%, take it up to 900, it's over 100% increased growth by CO2 alone. Mother Nature is real smart. When the atmospheric CO2 gets enriched, enriched over here, the number of little breathing pores on the plant leaves, the stomata, not only decreases, they actually decrease in size also, which is not shown here, but from a leaf that would have this many in a low CO2 atmosphere like today, they drop down because they don't need to have as much respiration with the atmosphere to get the CO2 they need, and so they don't lose as much moisture to the air, which we think is one reason they don't need as much water. <clears throat> Additional benefits. For people that want to green the earth, and that's probably everybody in this room and everybody on, on earth, really, uh, Adding CO2 clearly accomplishes that. It enhances the capacity of ecosystems and habitats, what everybody would like to see. It raises the productivity per acre, so importantly, 
it will prevent the conversion of as much currently pristine land and ecosystems to have to be converted to farmland just to feed the earth. So you have more food for the expanding population. It helps plants survive stresses. You need to go into that book. You need to go to our website at plantsneedco2.org or CO2 Science with the IDSOs. You can see all of this and see how well documented it is on all of these things. It enhances the root growth, the density, helps with nitrogen conversion out of the atmosphere to make it usable for plants. Okay, let's look at Earth's history on CO2 here. This is 500 million years ago, back in the Cambrian, 7,000 parts per million. Then it dropped down and for 120 million, 140 million years or so, it was in the three to 5,000 parts per million range. By the way, at about 4,400 parts per million, we had an ice age in here. <clears throat> that gives you a hint where we're headed. It dropped way down and early on when I started putting this together, I said, aha, the CO2 level dropped and it caused a big ice age. But we know from studying ice cores, it was just the opposite. The temperature dropped and the CO2 followed it down. But look at all the different kind of plant species and I won't read them all. By the way, I've got about 60 copies of these slides sitting back there that you can grab as you go out if you want. And a lot of these plants simply evolved when CO2 levels were much higher, and I'm sure that's one reason that they're responding so well. Look how little CO2 is in the atmosphere right now. We're way down here. We don't want it to get much lower. Okay, it is clearly not a pollutant. It's in our every breath. It's in all these soda pops we drink. You get down, I love the one by Professor Hap Happer at Princeton. He testified this under oath at one of the city uh, Senate committees. He says, in the United States submarines, where they keep these submariners underwater sometimes for two months at a time on these nuclear submarines, he says the little red light doesn't even start to blink to indicate high CO2 levels until it gets to 8,000 parts per million. 7,000 is as high as it's ever been in the last 500 million years. Even the government, unrealizing probably, is supporting the fact that CO2 is not a pollutant to humans anyway. Now, this is the one I really like. I have a lot of scars in my back because I was chairman of the National Wetlands Coalition for 10 years and man alive, everybody came after me because they thought we were a bunch of crazy developers. Anyway, I love to look the environmental extremist in the eye and say, we are greener than you are. Now, what is we? It's we folks that have been converting fossil fuels into usable energy and putting carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere from where it came. Anyhow, they don't know what to say to that, so they won't say anything. I'm trying to engage them in a conversation. I cannot get them riled up enough because they realize with all this documentation here, they realize they can't beat us on this subject. We clearly have them where we want them on that. And the reason they don't want this subject to get any higher profile is they do not want this catastrophe that they're predicting to go away because they are scaring the money out of your pockets. Okay, let's go on to the empirical evidence right quick. <clears throat> it ranges from all natural to, you know, CO2 is the major driver. I'm trying to communicate with the public now, the voters and the politicians. I've identified 18 climate drivers here. When I said I've identified them, you guys have done all the work. I've just simply put them together. But I say there's more than one climate driver. It's not just carbon dioxide. And I go through, depending on the time, I'll walk through these things and explain them to people. And in my little book, and there's 20 copies or so of my book left back there that you can grab if you want, it describes all of these things. Okay, this is, of course, the one that Al Gore uses all the time and talks about on Oprah and everything. And the only problem, and he didn't really say it, but he certainly intimated that CO2 was causing the problem here. Getting back to the subject that was talked earlier, you can see the shape of Earth's orbit has triggered, we think, a lot of the big ice ages. But look at the amount of eccentricity here, and it was higher for the last three interglacials, and it is weaker on this one. 
And I agree that I think that may be the reason that we're going to stay in this interglacial longer because it's a much weaker cycle and it may not flip us back into an ice age as quickly. Anyway, that was Willie, that was what I was talking about yesterday. Okay, go. Ice core analysis. This is the one Monin did in 2003, even though Fisher did the first one in 99. Temperature on the bottom, 20,000 years ago in the ice age, 10,000 years ago in our interglacial. Going along with temperature, clear inflection point. Temperature started up. Then it inflected down in the younger dries, bounced back up, and then it flattened out here. CO2 level rolling along, clear inflection point. It started up here, except it was six or 700 years after the temperature had begun to rise. Then we went up here, the temperature dropped, the CO2 level not only kept rising, it actually jumped up. Here again, there's about 500 years between that. See, uh, temperature went up, leveled out into our interglacial, CO2 level continued to drift up, and this is that six to 800 year lag again. Okay. The other thing that I don't see in there is when the CO2 level began to rise here, after temperature began to rise, I don't see any positive feedback in there. There's no change in the slope of that incline going up. So the history doesn't show the positive feedback that they talk about. The other thing is the logarithmic decline. The best way to explain that to the non-scientist is just to show it and show what 20 parts per million, 40, 60, 80, 100, how much impact that had early on and how little impact we are out here today at 387 parts per million. And they can understand that. And then you have to try to explain positive feedback, which gets very complex. And I just say the school is still out on that, although I think most of us think it's, it's neutral to negative. Okay, how do the models get such huge catastrophic forecast? Well, here's Dr. Edso, here's Dr. Linson. Here are a lot of sensitivities of Earth to doubling of CO2. Here is IPCC's lowest sensitivity right here. That is five times higher than this one. And so that really helps them get a catastrophic forecast out of the future. And of course, that's their high level. And you can see why they still show that CO2 has a big effect, even though it's had a logarithmic decline. Okay, getting to the empirical evidence. This was when the temperatures were declining. These, not, these have jumped back up into here. They're still not up to the bottom of the IPCC's projections yet. But as Phil Jones says, it's leveled out for the last 15 years. Okay, go back. That's that 10 years. Prior to that, this is when all of the hoopla went on about CO2 and uh, temperature rising together. Prior to that, we had our little ice age coming for 30 years. 1910 to 1940, we had a 30 year rise here, which is as steep or steeper than that one. Prior to that, we had 35 years of cooling. You look at this, that's the 1980s and 90s, this is 1910 to 40, this is 1860 to 1880, all of those are about the same steepness of rise, so there's nothing unprecedented about the rate of rise. That was just that little red part on the end of this, so let's go back farther. Earth has been warming for 300 years, not for 150 years since the Industrial Revolution. Prior to that, it cooled for 500 years going into the Little Ice Ages. Prior to that, it warmed for probably four or 500 years because it was beyond my chart. Here's the dark ages. IPC says the CO2 level stayed flat during that whole period except for the last half of this little rise here when it popped up the hockey stick. So the, the public can understand that. They can understand increasing temperatures, lowering temperatures. This is going back for the entire Holocene, which shows the Holocene optimum. I'm not going to go through all that. This is where we are today. Little Ice Age, Medieval Warm Period, Roman Warm Period, etc. Ice Age. It just shows that uh, the temperature today is 
up there despite the fact that we're at 387, um, that it's been warmer even when it was lower CO2. What's strange about our current interglacial? It is the coolest of the last five, despite 100 parts per million more CO2. Go back farther, Pagani said between 25 million years ago and 5 million years ago that the, there was a disconnect clearly between CO2 and the temperature changes. You've all seen this today. If you've been attending the thing, this didn't show up, so there's no greenhouse footprint there. This is a Confessions of Ken Trenberth. I don't have his name in here. He talks about all the frailties of the models here and the guys and avowed warmest, but yet he admits that they have all these problems with the warmers, with the uh, models, and this is the one I really like. New modeling work should increase our understanding of factors we previously did not account for or even recognize. So I don't know why they keep foisting these on the public. Okay. You know who's motivated? Wall Street's motivated, the green industries, the administration's going to get tax money and use it to buy votes one way or another. Academia, because of getting their grants. Environmental extremists scare the money out of our pockets. They don't want this to go away. And of course, the media knows we all love catastrophes to look at. You know that the <clears throat> hurricanes aren't up, the tornado frequency is down. I don't need to run through this list of skeptics, but the general public. It does impress them when they see who these people are worldwide that don't believe the story they're being fed every day. You've got nine state climatologists that don't believe it, nine UN IPCC authors don't, 12 expert reviewers, six others, 10 NASA scientists, one brave EPA scientist, and I didn't get, I didn't get to hear Alan Carlin's talk. I wanted to meet that guy. Anyway, that's us. Now, if I punch the right button, this is going to all be over with because I'm going to advance to that. I'm going to hit, whoops, escape. escape. Right. There's that. Then I'm going to come down yeah. and grab that one right there. And then I'm going to come up and double click on this, if I remember. Supposed to be more than music. That's right. While they're doing that, let me end with a let me end with a few bullet points. CO2 is not the major driver. Thank goodness, CO2. Oh, okay, it's playing now. This is 39 seconds long. There we go. That's 450 parts per million and 180% increase. That's day five. 21% increase going on. This may be the two minute one. <laughs> I don't think the 39 second one made it. Anyway, you can see what only changing carbon dioxide does for plants. Now, Earth is almost starved of CO2. If we drop below the 180 parts per million in the last ice age and get to 150, the plants will quit growing and we'll have a dead Earth to be living on. We have never had runaway global warming in 500 million years. Do we want to bet our economic future and way of life on something that has never happened? It's only in the models. We're betting our future on that. Anyway. For those who don't know about this, this video is widely available and is through uh, Craig Ixo's uh, website, co2science.org. So please go watch that. We apologize for the rush a little bit because we want to keep to time. And uh, now the session is open to question, please. Perhaps for five, ten minutes. Hello, my name is Maggie Towerfield Cruzel, uh, and I have a question for uh, Professor Kandekar and a question for Leighton Stewart.